So welcome to the uh, welcome to the Ruth and Tracy Storer lectures. I'd like to first thank uh, Ruth and Tracy Storer for making this wonderful series of lectures. You can't hear me. Turn off the microphone. You'll be able to hear me. What's wrong? Hello? Hello? Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. <laughs> so first, thanks to Ruth and, and uh, Stacy. I'm so old that I met Ruth uh, on many occasions. Anyway, the, sta the stories were wonderful people, and it's great that they've endowed this lecture series. It's an extraordinary pleasure for me to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Ari Hoffman. So Ari was here at Davis in the mid-1980s, uh, incredibly, as my first postdoc. But Ari started in Holland, then moved as a child to New Zealand and from New Zealand to Australia. And in New Zealand and Australia, Ari developed what is a truly astounding work ethic by being a truck farmer, by spending his childhood working on a truck farm, being a proper Australian, after he finished his uh, high school diploma, he went traveling the world, lived on a kibbutz for a while before starting his undergraduate career uh, and finishing at Monash University to get his PhD under Peter Parsons at uh, La Trobe. Parsons, who was a student, one of the last students of Ari Fisher. Ari came here, as those, any of you who know both me and Ari know that I learned far more from Ari than he learned from me. Among my proudest days when Ari was my postdoc was when I could do an experiment half as fast as Ari could. Ari back in those days was sort of a slacker. He was here as my postdoc for I think 16 months and only wrote eight papers. Uh, since then, he's been much more productive. Uh, Ari is one of the great evolutionary geneticists that we have, and amazingly, as a, an extraordinarily accomplished evolutionary geneticist, he has devoted himself for the last couple of decades to seeing how he could use his insights from evolutionary genetics to solve real practical problems involving pest control, involving response to climate change, and how we might use a discovery that he made while he was my postdoc, Wolbachia population biology to control dengue fever. Ari will be talking about the dengue work tomorrow. Today he's talking about species adapting to climate change, what's possible. Thanks very much, Michael. It's really nice to be here. And as Michael said, I sort of have an hist historical association with this place. And um, it hasn't changed very much. And I think it's probably a good sign. It's still obviously a terrific place to do biological sciences and evolutionary and ecological sciences in particular. So I think that's a very proud heritage that this place actually has. So as Michael said, I, I'm going to talk about climate change today and I'll talk about what back here tomorrow. And, um, and in a sense, both these talks have quite applied outcomes. Um, and I'm going to be fairly general today and probably a bit more specific tomorrow when I talk about the Wolbachia story. Now, obviously, at the moment, we face a pretty serious situation. And anyone who tries to argue that we don't, I think, is hiding in the sand. And in Australia in particular, we, of course, are exposed to many extremes to climate that we haven't seen before. And anyone who saw the Australian news a few days ago, this is actually um, a graph of temperature across Australia on the 7th of January, will realize that um, we are breaking records left, right, and center. And we've got to the stage where the, um, the weather office had to invent a new um, level of stress, heat stress, that we've been exposed to. So that beautiful color you see in the middle is actually 50 degrees. So that's the sort of situation we face. And, and of course, on this particular day, we broke the records, and that's the average temperature across the entire Australian countryside um, was around 40.7 degrees. So, you know, so clearly we're heading into uncharted territory at the moment, and that's certainly the case as much in the US as it is in Australia. And the question really is, you know, from a biodiversity point of view, where do we go next? Now, traditionally, arguments about biodiversity have really been about, you know, are we ensuring that we're conserving all our biodiversity? Are we locking up the right sorts of areas to be able to say, hey, you know, we've conserved it. 
And in Australia, like in the US, we have a national reserve system, which consists of nature reserves and national parks and the like. And what we have been trying to do in the last 100 years is to make sure that those areas are representative. So in other words, we want to make sure that we capture all these areas as representing what's out there at the moment. Now, in Australia, as in the case of the US, we have an amazing range of unique um, plants and animals that we want to conserve in this national reserve system. And on the top right-hand side of that slide, you can see what our current national reserve system looks like in Australia. You know, and we're fairly proud of that. We can basically say, look, you know, we really are capturing nature pretty much as it is, with a few exceptions. And that big map that you're looking at has some brown areas and some white areas. And the brown areas are really the ecological zones that at the moment we don't capture particularly well in our natural reserve system. So if you're going to set up a new national park, what you'd be trying to do is to capture those areas. But you can see a lot of the country is actually captured very nicely in our natural reserve system. So, you know, that's something we're proud of. We can tick a lot of boxes. Fights are ongoing about expanding that reserve system, but we're doing pretty much okay, we think, as it stands. Now, the challenge, and this really is, is typified very nicely in this report that um, came out from CSIRO, this Dunlop et al. report from last year, is that the world, of course, is changing very rapidly, and that means that the areas that we're capturing now may not be particularly good for the future. So in other words, we anticipate that on the climate change, that brown area is going to increase a little bit. So that brown area is really where you're capturing, you know, one to five percent of the biodiversity that you think you're going to be able to preserve into the future. And this is obviously conjectural, these are obviously models, and you imagine that on the climate change, that brown area is going to increase. And the modelling really indicates something pretty dramatic. Under the current scenario, this is what the brown area is going to look like. So in other words, by 2070, under the current conditions, we anticipate under these sorts of models that almost the entire continent is not going to be captured by our national reserve system. So effectively, what we've set up to preserve our biodiversity is not going to preserve our biodiversity at all. So we've gone from this situation to this situation in a fairly short period of time. Now, you know, you look at those and I think that's amazingly frightening because what that's really saying is that for the entire Australian continent, we are dealing with an environment that we haven't seen before. So animals and plants are going to have to be able to deal with an environment that they haven't seen before. And the question then becomes, well, how can they do that? And, you know, on the one hand, you could say, well, it's just going to be too difficult. This is in the too hard basket. But on the other hand, of course, there are ways in which animals and plants might be able to cope with these situations. So I deal with one, well, I, I work in a couple of environments, but one of the environments that I work in is this lovely area um, of Victoria, New South Wales, called the Australian Alps. I mean, they're not like the Swiss Alps, they're not peaks that have snow on top, they're not even like the Sierra Nevadas, but they're sort of these flat mountains, they go up to about 2,000 metres, and they don't really have permanent snow, but they have an amazing biodiversity, which includes marsupial biodiversity and plant biodiversity, as well as invertebrate biodiversity. So this very biodiverse area has, as many other areas in Australia, already started to see the consequences of climate change kicking in. So we've been tracking this environment, or at least you know, many people have been tracking this environment over the last 50 years or so. And in the last few years, this is really what we've seen happen. So we've seen temperatures changing and we've seen precipitation changing as well. So precipitation is going down, and as you can see over a fairly short period, you can see that there's been a quite a marked change in precipitation, so it's getting much drier. Sure, it jumps, but the, the downward trend is pretty much um, very strong. It's a very strong signature, and of course the average temperature is going up quite dramatically. In fact, it's gone up by about two degrees in that particular environment. So, the last 30 years have seen big changes, and of course we see vegetation changes going along with those changes as well. So this is something that we are seeing happen, and we know it's going to be much more dramatic in the future. So that top graph shows you what's happening to the grasses. The grasses are a core part of this ecosystem, and you can see that they are declining in cover quite markedly. The forbs are going up, 
and the shrubs are also going up. So everything, if you like, is becoming a bit more shrubby and a bit more forby, and those alpine grasses really are starting to be on the way out. Big changes in abundance, very large changes that we're already seeing. So these sorts of things are being documented in our country quite widely now, and in the US as well, of course. Now, one of the things about climate change is that you also face the unexpected, and you can never quite see where something might come left of field. So climate change is about temperature, it's about precipitation, but it's also about many more complicated things that you can't quite see happening, and these things always catch us unawares. And of course, in the US and Canada, you've had the bark beetle situation that have denuded very large parts of um, forests in places like British Columbia. And in Australia, we also see these unexpected things happen. And, you know, and typically what they do is they involve interactions between plants and herbivores, and those herbivores are often insects. So here's one that we see in the alpine area. We have an alpine case moth and an alpine swift moth. And what we are seeing is damage occurring from those particular moths associated with climate change. So we're seeing a signature of climate change where a lot of these grass areas are actually dying off as a consequence of these moths coming in. So it's just to remind us that, you know, when it comes to climate change, things are not necessarily that straightforward. Things can come left of field. You don't necessarily expect them, but of course you would like to predict them as um, ecologists and biologists generally. So we have some predictive power, but there is also an awful lot we don't know that is going to happen and catches unawares. The other thing that's going to happen under climate change is, of course, the invasive species are going to kick in. And again, you know, in California, I noticed some excellent evidence of invasive animals and plants moving up in elevation. And in Australia, we're also seeing that in this alpine region. So this is an example of some wild carrots and, and white clover moving into disturbed areas that have, been, um, that have been basically disturbed as a consequence of these sorts of activities I've been describing. So you can see that the white clover and those sorts of things is impinging on that beautiful native environment quite quickly. And again, this is something that we're going to see happen again and again. Climate change is very much part of changing interactions among species and then invasives coming in as well as the biodiversity having to deal with it. So the question really is, you know, can animals and plants adapt to climate change? Is this basically going to be an inevitable consequence that we are going to move from a very rich biodiverse fauna and flora to something that is going to be dominated by these sorts of plants, these sorts of invasive species? Do the existing fauna and flora have any potential to, if you like, bite back? And what we tend to think about is this PME situation where, you know, clearly movement is an option, and that's really what I've been talking about, but maybe the um, plants and animals can cope with plasticity. Maybe they can become plastic, they can acclimate to overcome these sorts of problems. So as conditions become drier, maybe the plants will change the way that they extract water from the soil. And that can be a plastic response to the environment, or it can be an evolved response. Evolved responses, of course, take longer. That's when, obviously, you need allelic changes in the population kicking in. And evolved responses can also have a major impact. So we have evolution as one option, we have movement as one option, and we have plasticity as another option. Now, those predictions that I was showing you, when a whole country becomes brown, really only allows one of these factors to be considered, and that's movement. It really does ignore this whole issue of evolution and it also ignores this issue of plasticity. So as biologists, the challenge we have is to really say to ourselves, well, to what extent can plasticity and to what extent particularly can evolution kick in and prevent these sorts of situations happening? To what extent can plants and animals adapt to counter these sorts of big changes that we're expecting? And that's really what I want to focus on in this particular talk. And I'll focus particularly on evolution. I'll say a few things about plasticity along the way. But I want to ask the question, to what extent will we trigger evolutionary events that can actually occur to counter climate change to stop that browning of our continent actually happening? Is that a realistic expectation or not? So if you, do, if you set up some models, and this is something that, that Michael Carney and I did a few years ago with respect to this particular mosquito species, and this is really one of the first illustrations 
to demonstrate that evolution can actually matter. We really wanted to illustrate, particularly to the public and to the ecologists, that evolution can make a big difference, at least when it comes to certain types of organisms. So we took, instead of taking something that was important from a biodiversity point of view, we took instead a health problem mosquito called Aedes aegypti. So this is a mosquito that causes dengue, and dengue is a problem in northern Australia, and of course in much of the world. And we wanted to ask the question, can evolution cause this dengue mosquito to do different things to what you might otherwise expect under climate change? And this mosquito does something really interesting in that it has a life cycle where it effectively diapauses at the egg stage. So what this mosquito does is it lays its eggs, the eggs dry out, and then those eggs have to survive for a period before the eggs hatch and then the mosquito develops again. And those eggs that are drying are really waiting, if you like, for the next rain event to occur and that fills up the container where these mosquitoes lay their eggs. So this mosquito is cycling through periods of drying, waiting for the eggs to hatch and then developing to the next generation. So what we could do is we could have a very simple evolutionary model where we allow the extents to which those eggs could survive a drying period to evolve. We've got a simple trait. We know that that trait is very important from a climate adaptation point of view. And we wanted to see if we let that trait evolve in a realistic way, what difference does that make to this particular mosquito? So we're taking evolution. And then, if you like, we're mapping evolution onto the distribution of this particular species. And basically what happens is as follows. So here we have a, a range of different situations. And on the left-hand side, you've got a situation where there's no evolution. So there's no, if you like, heritability for this trait, no genetic variation that can't adapt. And on the right-hand side, we have two situations where evolution can occur. And I've just picked a spot in northern Australia, which is of interest to us because it is the place where Darwin occurs and also a place that potentially can be affected by dengue. And what we've then done is said, OK, let's allow evolution to occur or let's not allow it to occur. And I'll just go through that again. So you've just got to compare the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And this is the predicted distribution of this mosquito with and without evolution of that one simple trait. And as you can see, what happens on the right-hand side is that that distribution of that mosquito goes to Darwin and it actually covers Darwin quite nicely. So on the right-hand side, we have a problem with this mosquito in Darwin, a population centre, and on the left-hand side, we don't. Evolution, 2050, we have a problem with dengue potentially in Darwin. Without evolution, we don't have a problem. So this is a simple illustration to show you the power of evolution to influence the distribution of the species. And of course, in this particular case, to also have some major health consequences. So we think this is a good way to think about a sort of problem and at least get the message across to people that evolution can matter. Realistic values of evolution based on parameters that have been estimated can make a huge difference in terms of where this sort of species goes. So what we now want to do, of course, is to turn our attention to the natural environment and back to biodiversity and conservation issues. So the first thing you can ask yourself is, well, you know, has evolution actually been demonstrated in reality, or is it only simulations that show that evolution can occur? And so the answer to that question is that we are seeing an increasing, slowly increasing, but an increasing number of cases where people are demonstrating evolutionary shifts in response to climate change. And these are just the cases that, as of middle of last year, have been documented. There's a couple to add to this, and every year I anticipate adding to this slide and making it much more cluttered, hopefully, as time goes on. So there's a range of organisms represented there. Um, birds, plants, uh, mosquitoes. On the right-hand side is a pitcher plant mosquito that a lot of people would know about here. Um, and obviously some Drosophila and also some beetles. So we do have cases accumulating of recent climate change in the last few decades being documented um, evolutionary responses to those. So the case that I was involved in um, was in a Drosophila species, and this is actually a somewhat different case to some of these other ones, and that's we first documented evolutionary changes 
occurring by looking at a specific gene and a specific inversion. So the specific gene we looked at was called ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase, and the specific inversion we looked at was something called 3RP. And I'll talk about that inversion in just a sec. So if you look at the top graph, you can see that as we go from a situation from the left of that graph, which is 15 degrees latitude to the right of that graph, which is 43 degrees latitude, and in Australia, that's going from the top of the country down to Tasmania, and this is all done on the east coast. So that's a climb from the east coast of Australia. The US east coast also shows this sort of climb in this particular gene. So it's a climb that we know for a variety of reasons to be under climatic selection. So in the tropics, you have one form of that gene, and the temperate, you have that same form being at a very low frequency, and a different form of that gene takes over. So the ADH gene has two forms, one form dominates in the tropics, another form dominates in the temperate area, and that's what the situation looked like in 2002 and 2004 when we did some collections of these flies. The inversion, so this is in a big inverted loop in one of the chromosomes of Drosophila, so some individuals have the inversion, some don't, and that also changes in frequency very dramatically as you go from the top of the east coast of Australia down to the bottom. So one form, the inverted form, is common in the tropics and the absence of an inverted form is common down south where conditions are much more temperate. And again, we have the same latitudinal range being considered in this particular slide. The inversion looks a bit like this. You can actually score it cytologically like people used to in the old days, but of course you can also develop molecular markers these days to score this inversion. And I should mention that we did use molecular markers to score this thing. So you have this big loop that you can score, um, and this is a very large inversion covering a large part of the right arm of one of the chromosomes in Drosophila. So how has that changed? Well, it turns out that in this particular case, we were very fortuitous and that um, John Oakeshott and co-workers had actually characterized this inversion the old way, cytologically, back in the 80s. And they'd also scored this ADH gene using a different approach to what you used. And in both cases, what you can see is that back in the 80s, the situation was different to what we saw back in 2000. So what's actually happened is that the tropical form of that inversion has increased in frequency, increased in frequency along the east coast of Australia. The ADH form that's common in the tropics has also increased in frequency and this is over a period of only about 20 years. So you had quite abrupt changes along that climb, genetic changes in these flies over a period of 20 years. And that's, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, we're fairly confident that's a genetic response to climate change in these flies over a 20 year period. So these flies are adapting by becoming more tropical, at least for these particular genetic markers. And, you know, the 3RP region this inverted region is really interesting because people are now starting to discover, this is a recent paper published in the last year by Thomas Flatt's group, but they're now starting to discover that that 3RP region, that region of the inversion, seems to contain a bunch of genes that are involved in climate adaptation. And again, this is data from North America for the benefit of people here, but again, they showed that that region of the chromosome seems to contain these climate adaptation genes, you know, which I think is really exciting. So we can track genetic change happening in these populations across time, or across a 20 year period, quite effectively, and lots of other independent evidence points to climate being involved in that genetic change. So that's an example of a genetic change. We can also, of course, look at phenotypes, and this is not our own work, but this is work by Finnish researchers headed by Carell. And they were studying elps, so they were studying owls, sorry, and, and this particular species of owl they were looking at occurs in two colour morphs, a brown morph and a grey morph. And what's happened over time is that the brown morph, which is a genetically determined morph, has become more common and the grey morph has become less common. And what's happened in the last few decades, which is indicated in that bottom left hand graph, is that the snow cover in the regions they were studying has decreased quite dramatically. So the snow has become much less deep over time in the last few decades. And it turns out that when there's a lot of snow around, 
the grey form does quite a lot better than the brown form, and when there's less snow around, you get a reverse situation. So if you look at the snow depth and the survival, you can see that the brown form, which is that red line on that graph at the top there, top left there, decreases quite precipitously. The survival is much less of that ground form when there's, um, when there's uh, a deep snow cover compared to when there's not much snow cover. So this again is one of these situations where a polymorphism, a genetic polymorphism is changing. It's changing in the last few decades as these owls are adapting to one factor associated with climate change, in this particular case, snow depth. So there's a couple of examples, and as I said, there are several other examples that are emerging as people t undertake these longitudinal studies, and hopefully in the next few decades, we will have hundreds of these sorts of studies coming along. Now, this is all very well, and you know, as evolutionary biologists, of course, we can say, hey, this is fun, you know, we can study these systems and study them again all 10 or 20 years, and that's great, you know, we really can enjoy doing that. And we might even get a, you know, a nature or a science paper out of it, and, you know, that can look good in our CV. But that actually doesn't help people facing this sort of situation. You know, it's all very well to describe evolutionary changes, and you can do that very elegantly, but you need to be able to help people trying to make these predictions. What we're trying to do is to understand can evolution overcome these sorts of dramatic problems that we face? And that's the answer we really want. And of course, what we also would like to do is to then help in practical steps, recommending some practical steps to make this happen. So it's very nice, lots of elegant work being done. It needs to be done, I think it's very important, but it doesn't quite help you overcome this particular problem. So what can we do about this? You know, how can we come up with some useful ways of looking at this major problem? So what we can do is come up with a bunch of other approaches that don't rely on collecting longitudinal studies to tackle these sorts of issues. And I just want to talk about some of these now and also draw a few very preliminary generalizations. So the first thing we can do is to look at heritable variation. So if we find Genetic variation in traits that matter, so in other words, in traits that are involved in dictating the distribution and the abundance of animals and plants, if we can find genetic variation in those traits, then at least we can say, hey, there is evolutionary potential for adaptation at least to exist. So that's the first thing we can do. We can look for heritable variation. It's probably the simplest thing we can do, and it's something we can certainly do in a lot of different organisms. So let's see if this genetic variation now there. You need genetic variation to evolve. Let's see if we can find that genetic variation existing in populations. Now, when evolution occurs, of course, it doesn't just act on one trait and in one environment. It involves many traits in many environments. So we can also become a bit more sophisticated and say, well, when there are many environments and many traits, do we also still find that there's an evolutionary potential based on genetic variation? So is the genetic architecture of that response such that it still allows evolution to occur? We can also look at gene flow patterns, because some gene flow patterns help adaptation and some gene flow patterns hinder adaptation. And at the end, I just want to talk a bit about phylogenies briefly, because they might give us a quick and dirty way to get at this issue without having to wait for all the evolutionary studies required to answer those first three points. Okay, so let's look at this first one. Well, you know, here's the obvious equations that people use. You know, you can measure the narrow sense heritability of a trait, or of course you can measure some other aspect of genetic variance in a trait. So you can measure these quantities and see what they look like. Heritability goes from zero to one. Is it close to one? When you've got lots of evolutionary potential, or is it close to zero when you've got very little evolutionary potential? That equation includes VA, the additive genetic variance, the component that dictates how similar offspring are to their parents, is that a big value or a small value? If it's a big value, you're going to be able to evolve. If it's a small value, you're not going to be able to evolve very much. And, you know, typically people standardise those sorts of estimates by the mean. So these are very, very simple ways of measuring genetic variation in populations for particular traits. And there are many, many ways of measuring these things. You can do family studies, you can do selection experiments, 
um, and you can do comparisons of generations across the field where you have marked, in, in the field we have marked individuals. So we can do this sort of work and we can do it reasonably easily, at least in some groups of animals and plants. And of course, across the years, we have accumulated many hundreds of these estimates um, as we have done different types of studies. So in our particular case, we were interested in this issue of climate adaptation. So we decided to revert to looking at measures of heritable variation in a bunch of different Drosophila species. And we focused on Drosophila species that vary up and down the east coast of Australia. So if you like, this is our natural lab again. It's a bit like its situation with the genetic marker. That's a natural lab. It's also a natural lab for looking at these sorts of questions. So in Australia, we have some species of Drosophila that are rainforest specialists. They sit at the top of that east coast in little rainforest pockets, and they never leave those pockets. We have other species that occur all the way up and down the coast. You know, we have about 80 Drosophila species we can play with, and if we look at the wider range of related species, we can come up with several hundred. So there's lots of diversity, biodiversity, to play around with when we look at those species. And the beauty of it is that they cover a fantastic climate gradient. So you're going from the tropics down to temperate Tasmania. You're going from a latitudinal range, as I indicated before, that goes from 15 down to about 43. So a very, very wide range of climates that you can use for this purpose. So we started studying these species to answer this sort of question. And despite the fact that I started this talk by saying that climate change adaptation is going to be complicated, because you, know, you don't know if it's going to be biotic or abiotic or all those sorts of things in between, we did a quick and dirty approach. And we used the fact that if you look at Drosophila, you can almost predict where they occur around the world by looking at three traits. Desiccation resistance, cold resistance, and heat resistance under dry conditions. You take those three, and you can actually account for a large part of Drosophila distribution. So we figured if we were going to try and account for that brown space and how it might change by adaptation, this would be quite a nice, simple start, even though we acknowledge that climate change adaptation is going to be complicated. So here, for instance, there's a relationship between desiccation and precipitation. And you can see it's pretty tight. Here's the one for cold. Again, you can see it's pretty tight. You know, the R squareds are surprisingly strong for those sorts of relationships. So what this allows us to do is to say, you know, it's a bit like the mosquito situation where we could take that egg diapause phase. It allows us to take traits like CT max and CT min, so the minimum temperature these flies can tolerate, or something like desiccation resistance and 10% humidity or something like that, and say, well, to what extent can those traits evolve? Because clearly if they evolve, then the distribution of these species is going to be able to change. And of course, that means that these species can potentially keep up with climate change. So we had some simple traits. We then applied some very simple quantitative genetic techniques to get a handle on what was happening here. So the first experiment we published 10 years ago, which was a selection experiment, we took several of these species and we selected for desiccation resistance. If you get a strong response to selection, genetic variation is present. If you get no response to selection, there's no genetic variation present, or there are some ridiculously strong trade-offs happening in those populations. So we selected four species, and it turns out that some species show a very, very rapid response to selection, like Malonegaster and Simulon. So those are two widespread Drosophila species. And when we did the same experiments on one of these rainforest species that was locked up in these rainforest pockets, called Drosophila birchii, we got no response to selection. Each one of those dots is a generation. So we tried very hard by a lot of selection to actually increase the desiccation resistance of that species. So this says that this species, birchii, either has a very strong trade or it lacks genetic variation in order to be able to adapt. We looked for genetic variation in other traits, and it existed in that species. It was only a desiccation that it seemed to be lacking. So it could certainly adapt for other traits, but not for desiccation. But of course, the species is a very sensitive species. It sits in a moist rainforest pocket. It has a distribution 
where things are very, very wet. Tropical rainforests are very wet environments. So it actually has a very, very low level of desiccation resistance to begin with. And you know, you simply could not change that by selection. So it turns out, and you know, there's, there's a large amount of work that's gone behind this, but it turns out that this particular species had a low heritability or a low genetic variance or as genetic variance, whatever you want to call it, for desiccation resistance. So these two graphs give you a picture of a plot of several species that we've done since then. And what we're plotting here is desiccation resistance against genetic variation as measured by heritability or some other measure. It doesn't really matter what measure you use. And what you can see there is you get this sort of positive association. It curves off a bit to the right, but you get a positive association between desiccation resistance and evolutionary potential as indicated by genetic variation. So what this means is that if you're really sensitive, then you don't have a lot of genetic variation for this trait. If you're pretty resistant, you have more variation for this trait. So the problem is that most of biodiversity is actually tied up with species that have a low level of resistance. They are low on that y-axis, and they have this low evolutionary potential. The red line, by the way, indicates no evolutionary potential at all. That's a zero heritability. The species that are actually more resistant on the right-hand side have a much greater evolutionary potential. So this really caught us by surprise. Firstly, because we picked up so many zero or close to zero heritable variation measures. And secondly, because it was the specialist species that are found in these very, very wet habitats that were not showing evolutionary potential. And you know, this is the first time that people had really sort of started looking at these sorts of relationships. And if you look at that, you would say that biodiversity is in trouble because many species that constitute biodiversity are on that bottom of that y-axis. They are sensitive species. They sit in rainforests. They can't do very much. They are not very resistant. So you know, we don't know this is a general finding. It is a finding that we have made on these Drosophila species. And it is one that we are building up slowly um, and hopefully other people are going to do the same thing. Now, there is certainly other work going on in other labs that has also indicated that um, on occasions, let's just indicate those key groups, that on occasions you find that heritable variation can be very low. So don't forget that we're accounting for distributions. And here's an example of some other work that came out of Davis um, by Rick Grossberg and colleagues. And this is a very different organism. This is a crustacean where, again, they were looking for climate change adaptation and they didn't find genetic variation for the traits that were responding, that needed to respond in order to, in order to evolve um, to deal with climate change. So there are certainly other cases emerging. This is a very nice study of a very clear cut case, and there are several others appearing in the literature. So this is a potential problem. Some species can do it but quite a lot of species might not be able to. That is a very, very early conclusion that we need a lot of data on, and I hope it is not the true conclusion. Now, one of the interesting things that came out of this sort of work is that we also started asking the question, well, you know, with the sort of traits that we associate with distributions, there are different ways of measuring it. What is the best way of actually measuring these sorts of traits that you can link back to the ecology of a particular species? And this led to a controversy that's been running for about two or three years now, where people have said, well, you know, I'm really interested in heat resistance. I'm really concerned about these hot periods that we're going to get as a consequence of climate change and evolving to be able to deal with those hot periods. How can we do that? How can we measure that? And what people have typically done is they've said, OK, you know, you might take a fly or you might take a crustacean, you might take another organism, and you might hold it at one temperature and then move it up to another temperature. And that's the way that you actually measure heat resistance. And what's come out with some recent data that was particularly carried out by um, people in, in Stephen Chown's group is that they said, well, hang on a sec. What we need to be able to do when we're measuring these sorts of traits is to do something a little more complicated. You know, environments are not constant. You're not really going from a, a fairly mild environment to a fairly hot environment. But in nature, things change more quickly. 
And this led to a whole lot of people changing the way that we measure these physiological traits. So instead of jumping temperature, people then started doing these gradual heating and these gradual cooling experiments. And what happens when you do those sorts of experiments is that the threshold that organisms can manage to deal with from a temperature point of view can change very, very dramatically. So a species might have a limit of 40 when you suddenly move it to a hot climate, but if you slowly start heating up that same organism, then all of a sudden that limit can drop from 40 down to 37 or 36. So here's an example of a plot from Chown's group of CT max, the maximum temperature you can tolerate against the rates of heating of a particular organism. And as you can see, there's a dramatic effect of heating rates on the CT max. So we've actually gone back and we started redoing some of our experiments, including some of our heritability experiments, and we've come up with something that's pretty dramatic. So on the right-hand side, we have CT max when we don't ramp temperature, and that's the heritability estimate. Doesn't matter if you're talking about VA, it gives you the same result. But the heritability estimate for a couple of populations of Drosophila melanogaster. On the left-hand side, we have the situation when we start ramping these temperatures. So when you don't ramp, you get a heritability of about 15% or 22%, and that's significant if you look at those standard errors. So those populations, at least of malnagasta, can adapt to heat. But when you start ramping, when you start changing your assay and increasing gradual heat, then you find quite a different picture emerges. The heritability then goes close to zero, from 15 to 22% down to zero. So that suggests that you know, this is even more problematical, at least from a heat point of view. Coal doesn't do this, but heat certainly does this. So ramping rates can be critically important, and you have to think about how you do these actual assays, unfortunately. So we tend to use ramping when we do things these days. So again, this reinforces the fact that, you know, at least for some species, you're going to have a limited potential to adapt. Other species, not so, but certainly for these sorts of things, it's pretty negative. So I think you know, that first approach has thrown up a lot of surprises to us. When we started doing this work, everyone said to us, you know, the accepted norm was that all traits show heritable variation, all traits have the potential to evolve as long as you have some level of genetic variation and neutral markers in your population. We found that respect to these two traits, that certainly was not the case. You know, things are much more complicated than that, and there is limited evolutionary potential for some species to deal with these sorts of environmental stressful conditions. Okay, so that's one trait, that's a very simple situation. What happens when you go to multiple traits in multiple environments? Now, we've collected much evidence on this issue over the years, and many other people, of course, have as well. So one of the things that we've done in our alpine work, for instance, is to do transplant works, transplant experiments with various species to test the idea that if you're good in one environment, does it mean that you're also equivalently good or are you worse in a different sort of environment? So we've done quite a lot of work on grasses, these alpine grasses, with this sort of approach. So basically what you do is you take a couple of traits that vary up and down the mountains, this is all elevation work, and for these species of grasses, if you look at leaf length, as you go up the mountain, leaf length decreases and as you go up the mountain, plant circumference increases. So one's decreasing and one's increasing. You can then do one of these transplant experiments, and we typically do these transplant experiments across multiple mountains. So in this case, we have three mountains. We're moving it up and down to high elevation and low elevation sites and doing a fully randomized design when we do these sorts of experiments where we're transplanting them to these sorts of plots. So you know that's something that people have done for years back in the days when, you know, Clawson and Hickey did it in California, um, you know, 80 years ago, this is really, well, less than 80, but a long time ago, this is really when this sort of approach started. Very powerful approach. Now, what we find, and what people typically find, is that you get these environmental-based trade-offs when you do that. So for these grasses, we have a situation at the top where we're looking at a fitness trait, and this is survival, and we have taken the plants from a high environment, and that's the open symbols there, three mountains, three high environments, and planted them at the high location, so that's on the left-hand side of that top graph, or we've planted them at the low location, that's the right-hand side of that top graph. And as you can see, the survival is higher 
for the plants that originated from the high environments at the high location. And it flips over when you go to the low location. So we have a very clear evidence of a genetically based trade-off occurring in these transplant experiments. And if you look at those traits leaf length for circumference, and you do the fitness plots, and then you find that at the high altitude, the fitness increases as the circumference increases, and at the low elevation, the fitness decreases as the circumference increases. And leaf length shows exactly the opposite pattern. So you have these traits, they're under selection, they flip over, and it really means that a genotype of a plant that is adapted to a high elevation environment has characteristics that make it poorly adapted to a low elevation and vice versa. So if you're just looking at one trait or one environment, you're going to miss a lot of the picture if you're trying to estimate the potential evolutionary consequences of climate change for these plants and you're just looking at one environment that's appearing or one trait, you're going to miss it. And there may be constraints acting that require you to consider multiple environments and multiple traits. And those sorts of patterns have been repeated again and again in plant transplant experiments. We've also collected quite a lot of work indicating that this is also the case in flies. So we've done many mark release recapture experiments where we take flies, we make them more heat resistant by selection, genetically more heat resistant or genetically more cold resistant, taking advantage of that heritable variation. And then we release them in hot days and in cold days. So here's an example of this sort of experiment and the outcomes of those experiments. And those numbers in that table give you the relative fitness of these lines in a hot day versus a cold day. And this is just data I've plotted for one set of lines for lines that are hot adapted. So these are lines that are do better in the lab under hot conditions. If you release them and look at their potential to find food in the field, then you can see that all those numbers are over one. The fitness is much greater than one of those situations compared to lines that have not been selected. So in the hot conditions, those flies have an advantage. If you go to mild conditions, you can see that those values and those releases are all less than one. So those flies are showing a trade-off and that they are not as good under mild conditions um, as control flies. And interestingly, under cold conditions, you actually find that they also do better again than the control flies. So we have a trade-off between the mild conditions and the hot conditions, not between the hot and the cold so much for these particular lines. And again, you know, when people do these experiments, they often find these sorts of trade-offs. So if you're good at one thing, you're going to lose out on other things. And that's going to affect the rates at which you can evolve in response to climate change. Okay, so from one trait to many traits and many environments, things become a bit more complicated. From one trait, we see limits to evolution. Many traits, we see additional limits to evolution that's going to act to constrain evolutionary responses. But, you know, it might still be possible. The third thing we really have to consider is this issue of gene flow within a landscape. You know, why won't things adapt? Well, maybe one reason why, think, why things don't adapt is because the way that the genes are moving in a landscape prevents adaptation. So when you think about gene flow in a landscape, there are three ways of looking at it. There's one thing we call IBD, there's something we call IBE, and there's something we call maladaptive gene flow. IBD stands for isolation by distance. That's really just a gene flow that is random within a landscape, and the further out you go, the less likely you are to find related individuals. So if you think about a plant, most of its seed are dumped close to the parents and then sort of spread out randomly beyond that. Pollen, exactly the same sort of thing. Animals tend to produce their offspring. The offspring stay locally to the environments, but then spread out from there. So when you look at a small distance, you have genetic relatedness. As you go out, you tend to lose your genetic relatedness. So people often think about gene flow as following this IBD pattern. IBE is the one where you're going to get more adaptation. So IBE is isolation by environment. So this is where similar environments show higher rates of gene flow than different environments. Now, if you look at that picture down the bottom, those are the three mountains with the transplants that I had before. 
and IBE would mean that there is more movement between the top, one, top of one mountain to the top of the other mountain than the top and the bottom of the same mountain. And if you look at the low elevation side again, under IBE you would have more gene flow between all those low elevation sites than you would between the high and the low elevation sites. So if you have a genotype that does well at a high elevation or at a low elevation, it's mixing genes with other populations that also do well at a high elevation or at a low elevation. So this is going to promote adaptation. This makes adaptation much more rapid. So IBE is a very good thing when it comes to adaptation. Now maladaptive gene flow is exactly the opposite. If you have genotypes that are adapted to the top and the bottom, and most of the gene flow is occurring up and down the mountain, not across the tops or the bottoms of the mountains, then you're continually producing deleterious genes into the population that are not adapted for those conditions. So this is going to slow down in a very, very large way adaptation. So you don't just need genetic variation, but you also need gene flow to help you promote this adaptation process if it's going to be more general. So the question we can then ask is, well, from a climate change point of view, what do people find in natural populations? So for those grasses that I was talking about, the transplant experiments, we actually find pretty good evidence of IBE. So this is a pretty complicated figure but what I really want you to do is to focus on the number. So here we have three mountains, so MCH, MNCH, and NCSH. So those are your three mountains. And we have high elevation sites and low elevation sites for each of those mountains. And those numbers indicate the amount of gene flow that is occurring up and down those mountains as well as across the bottom and the top of those mountains. And as you can see, the, num the numbers are much bigger when you go across the top of the mountain or across the bottom of the mountain, then up and down the same mountain. So those distances are actually bigger, but there is more gene flow occurring between similar elevation environments than between those low and those high elevation points. So that's an example of IBE. It's gene flow that's going to help promote adaptation. So in this particular case, yes, we have different genotypes being favored, but we also have gene flow patterns that are going to help that whole process happen much more efficiently. So we've also done work in Drosophila again, and this is actually work going back um, a few years now, and um, it's work that sort of I've picked up more again, again more recently because I've suddenly realized that we have a good test of this. And this is in a, a Drosophila species that's called Drosophila serrata. And this is a very old picture, as you can see from an old paper. We'd never get away with diagrams these days in a paper like that. Um, but this is a species whose sudden distribution finishes just below Sydney. So at Wollongong is the most sudden point of the distribution of the species. And what we've done in the species is we've measured gene flow up and down the distribution of the species. It goes all the way to the top of Australia as well as down to just below Sydney. So it's quite a wide distribution. And we've also measured adaptive traits in this particular species. And the adaptive trait we've measured is the one that is associated with that sudden border, which is actually called resistance. And that shows a very, very interesting pattern that we've repeated over multiple years. This is data that we collected in the mid-90s. And this is genetically based cold resistance in a series of populations of that particular species. On the left-hand side, you are heading towards the southern border, the cold border of that species. On the right-hand side, you're heading away from that border towards the center of the distribution of the species. On the top graph, we have the situation as we see it post-winter. The mortality is lower in that population at the border than these other populations. So these populations have genetically got a high level of cold resistance. If we measure the same flies a few months later, before we go into the next winter season, we can see that there is no genetic difference in cold resistance at all in these populations. So we have a situation where we have a genetic shift across seasons. You have an adaptive shift. You're selecting for cold resistance. Where you expect it, you're becoming more cold resistant, and then you're losing it again. And this is just some work that we did later, a few years later, showing exactly the same thing. Pre-winter, post-winter, cold resistance, 
And you can see that post-winter, that mortality level um, basically changes, and that um, pre-winter, basically, all the populations are the same. So what's causing that? Well, what's causing that is, in this particular case, a lot of maladaptive gene flow. If you look at genetic distance along those populations, the genetic distance is zero, all those populations are mixing up completely during that period where the species is breeding. All those populations are completely mixing up and you end up with no genetic differences between those populations at all. So that's maladaptive gene flow destroying this beautiful adaptation that you get in response to cold in those southern border populations. That's one example. There are other examples in the literature. There's this nice paper by Fedorka published, et al. published um, last year, looking at crickets in North America, um, and again showing maladaptive gene flow occurring in response to cold climates as you go into Canada. So yes, you can get maladaptive gene flow, but we've been asking the question, how often does it actually occur? And we've been trawling through the literature, and this is work that I've been doing with Jay Sexton and Sandra Hangarten, and it turns out that most of the time you actually get IBE rather than maladaptive gene flow. These are all the relevant studies we could find across, you know, going from vertebrates to plants. And what you effectively show is that usually gene flow helps. Usually it's IBE and not maladaptive gene flow. You get a bit of IBD as well. So usually we think that gene flow actually helps in the right direction. It helps you to adapt to climate change. Okay, so those are some of the generalizations that you can get out of those approaches. So again, just to reiterate, we look at single traits, we find that some can change, they affect the distribution of species, and that means that evolution can occur. We find that some specialist species don't seem to have much heritable variation, and they might be in trouble, but we need to generalize those results. When we go to multiple traits and multiple environments, we find there are additional constraints that act potentially limit evolution, but it's very hard to make generalizations. When we look at gene flow in the landscape, often it's in the right direction to get adaptation, so that could certainly help. So, you know, so at the end of that, you sort of think, well, maybe yes and maybe no. The problem that we really face is that we have the situation where we can't wait. We need to be able to tell people trying to look at these models about adaptation now, not in the future. The problem is that these sorts of studies that we're doing are very labor intensive and take quite a long time to do. You know, that Drosophila data we collected took many, many years of study before we'd accumulated enough information to be able to make some rough generalizations. And if you're trying to do that across a lot of different groups, it becomes very, very difficult to do. And of course, that's Drosophila, or that's rapidly growing plants. And if you're trying to do those sorts of generalizations across vertebrates or trees, then that becomes even more difficult. So what we really need to do is to think about shortcuts we can take to measure adaptive potential. Can we do quick and dirties to get at this particular issue to help inform whether this is really going to be the situation or not? And one of the things that people have suggested one could do is to start looking at phylogenetic contexts, at phylogenetic constraints. So what happens when we start mapping these sorts of traits across phylogenies? Can we get an indication about what might actually happen? So data on evolutionary adaptation is difficult to collect. So we've done the, we've, you know, I've mentioned to you that these longitudinal studies are great but they don't really tell you the story. I've given you some approaches that can help, but again, they're very slow to do. And the trouble is that by the time you collect enough information, then you might already be facing a very dire situation. You need to be able to advise people now rather than the future. So we need to come up with quick and dirties that allow us to overcome these sorts of problems. And you know, maybe phylogenies and measurements of traits could provide one surrogate, as several people have suggested. So we've been trying to look at the situation in two groups of organisms. On the one hand, we've been looking at some native daisies, and that's work that's recently started. And we've also been collaborating with a Danish group, Volkolosius group, to do this in a very big way on different Drosophila species. And this is particularly work that Vanessa Kellerman has been involved in, and she was working in Volker's lab, but is now back in Australia. And Johannes Overgaard has also made a major contribution to this work. 
So what we decided to do was to do a hundred Drosophila species experiments. So we took a hundred Drosophila species from a range of different climates and we grew them under a standard set of conditions and we then measured these traits that we know are linked to distribution. So we're doing CT max, maximum temperature, CT min, minimum temperature, and all under these ramping assays, these assays of slow heating and slow cooling. And we also did desiccation resistance. And we then did some detailed phylogenetic analyses and asked the question, well, how phylogenetically constrained are these types of traits? And this is the answer we got. And if you look at the red areas, and you probably can't see those numbers at the back, but those red areas are indicating species that have a pretty good CT max. The blue areas are indicating species that have a very low CT max. And if you look at that, and don't forget these are all measured under standard conditions, you can see, without even doing the analysis, that there is strong phylogenetic signature for this particular trait. You can get entire clades that are either very resistant to high temperatures or very susceptible to high temperatures. And, you know, this, we found this quite surprising that the signature was as strong as we actually got. So what you could do is you could then turn this into um, some, a, a proxy for evolution. And I'm not saying this is correct or not, but this is certainly what people have argued. So one thing you could do is take a clay like that and say, well, you know, I think that the species at the bottom can become like a species it's separated from over a period of a few million years. It might go to Bonanda by selection. So you might say, well, you know, I'm going to draw the line somewhere along that phylogeny in terms of jumps those species can make in terms of evolving their CT max. And that's what people are hoping to be able to do. So for these phylog phylogenetically constrained species, where you're getting these lineages of quite closely related species, people are then saying, well, you know, maybe those are the evolutionary jumps and the adaptation that we can actually make. And certainly if you think about some groups like that Kikawai Serata group, then you are making a substantial jump in terms of changing a CT max, whereas for other clades, you clearly cannot change it very much at all. So that might be a quick and dirty handle to actually get on some, um, some recent numbers. And of course, the advantage is that you can construct these phylogenies for any group you like. You, know, you don't have to have a, an experimentally or a genetically tractable group to do these sorts of measurements. And that might be a quick and dirty way to start having a look at what might be possible. But of course, it then needs to be tested. So we then really need to do the selection experiments to demonstrate that we can make these jumps, at least in these model species, and not in other cases where we are getting tight constraints on the phylogeny. So, you know, I think that's a really powerful way potentially to at least develop some hypotheses that are worth testing into the future about adaptive potential. And then, of course, once we have those, we can then map those across species distributions and ask when species are in trouble. You know, we've certainly been doing this for Drosophila species, and the blue lines on those graphs, these are just six Drosophila species. The distribution points of these Drosophila species are marked by those hatched lines. So we have the blue lines as indicating currently when they expect it to be under stress and the red lines is where they expect to be under stress in the future. And as you can see that those red lines are way above the blue lines. So this is when we're going to exceed stressful conditions in these species. And when we cross those dotted lines of those red bumps, we know that we expect to get extinction of those species. And of course, we can then put evolution into those, put adaptation in those and change those red lines and learn something about biodiversity adaptation. So that's, the, that's basically where we're heading. And of course, you know, we're not the only people heading in this direction. The lizard people, particularly Barry Sinerva and other people, um, you know, and Ray Yui and others are working on this as well and also making these sorts of assumptions in terms of trying to make meaningful predictions. And that will hopefully allow us to at least be able to say, well, in these areas, we're going to have threats, and in other areas, we're not going to have threats. So, this is, so you know, this, the lizard work, for instance, has been used to argue that the tropics are particularly susceptible. The fly work we've done actually argues not the tropics, but this, the mid-latitude areas are the ones that are in trouble. So at least we can start thinking about those brown areas and the ones that might turn from brown to white as a consequence of adaptation. So I, you know, I, I think those are useful guidelines we can actually formulate. So this is the title that I started off with, Species Adapting to Climate Change, What's Possible 
And hopefully I've given you a taste of, yes, you can demonstrate evolution, yes, there are an increasing number of cases, but the situation is such that we, c we can't wait to simply add to our demonstrations. So we have a number of different conclusions that we can start making, at least very tentatively, um, and, you know, s some groups have the right variation, some groups have weak constraints, some groups have favourable gene flow, but there are others that clearly do not, and it's these widespread and more resistant species that seem to have the right patterns in order to be able to adapt into the future. So that's a very, very preliminary conclusion based on some data we have collected so far. The one thing I haven't talked about here is generation time, and that is clearly something else that we have to consider moving into the future. Short generation species are going to be able to do a lot better than, than long generation species. And, and the point I really want to finish up on is that, you know, this is all very well, but for a long generation species in particular, maybe what we need to do is to think not only about trying to predict adaptive capacity, but also trying to predict how we can improve adaptive capacity. So when you've got species that you know have long generation times, they're going to be evolving very slowly, maybe we can take some shortcuts. And one of the shortcuts we can make that we've been arguing for and other people have been arguing for, you know, this is a paper that we had with Carlos Scro and Andy Lowe, is to say, let's look at those gene flow patterns and increase deliberately patterns of gene flow. So let's not only allow IBD or IBE to occur, but if you like, think about the future environments that these species are going to be exposed to and implement some gene flow of our own. Maybe we can enhance gene flow in such a way that we can increase adaptive capacity of these populations. And I think for long-lived species, that may well be a very powerful way to go, particularly when we know we have good evidence of genetic variation to climate um, occurring in those species. So I think we need to act now. I think we need to collect data that's a bit dirty before we move to the beautiful stuff that we can all do as biologists. But I think the situation is such that we can't quite wait for that. And that's where I'll finish up, except just to acknowledge our funders. And hopefully I've acknowledged people along the way that have contributed in a major part of this work. But there are many, of course, that I haven't mentioned as well. Thank you. So there are, when you think about translocations, there are two levels that you think. So the question, the question was, aren't you going to get into trouble if you're thinking about moving a lizard species from a rock and going to a different environment? So there are two types of translocations. On the one hand, we have species translocations, and on the other hand, we have genetic translocations. And I think they are very different things. So on the one hand, you're basically saying, I am not taking a species and moving it into an area or a region where that species has not occurred, because then I would be doing the former. I'd be moving my lizard into my new environment. Instead, what we're saying is that we're hoping to enhance gene flow within the existing distribution of species. So in other words, if you look at this, if you look at this particular graph here, so I'll give you a concrete example. So at the moment, when people do revegetation, they tend to source their seed from a local environment, and there are actually laws about that. So for instance, I think the law in Minnesota is that if you revegetate the prairie, you have to get a grass that occurs in an area that's no greater than 100 miles from where you're revegetating. In Australia, we have even more stringent laws that says that when you're revegetating a eucalyptus you have to go 20 kilometers or less within that environment. Now we know that climate is going to change dramatically in those locations. So those species are adapted to their local climates and it's certainly important to maintain local adaptation. But of course you want an insurance policy because you want to make sure that those species are going to be able to survive in the future. You know, we've had massive deaths, for instance, of red gum forests in Australia 
And we know that red gums away from an area can be much more resistant to drought, for instance. And we wouldn't have had those massive deaths if those genotypes had actually been present in those environments. So what we're advocating is to say, sure, when you revegetate, take most of your plants from the local environment, but also include quite a lot of genotypes from further out. So collect your seed for the same species further out and throw them into that same environment. And you know, you have to remember that we are already dealing with heavily fragmented environments a lot of the time across our countryside. So a lot of the time what we're doing is reconnecting and overcoming the fragmentation that already exists and that's already cutting out gene flow that normally would have occurred a few hundred years ago. So I think at that level that's a very safe and secure and cautious approach and a lovely insurance policy you can build into any re-veg work that you do. And of course you can extrapolate the same sorts of arguments to plants and animals. I'm not saying throw plants into a totally new environment, I'm saying firstly start mixing up genotypes because that's a sure way that you can at least increase evolutionary resilience into the future. The thing is you have to do it now, right? I mean if you're trying to plan for a three to four degree temperature increase into the future and, you, and a decrease in precipitation of 30 to 40 percent, then you have to do that now because otherwise if you, if you wait 20 or 30 years when those conditions have arrived, you won't have those seedlings growing there and you won't have that opportunity. I'm talking, about I'm talking about diversity in general, genetic diversity in general, rather than making an educated guess exactly about which environment is going to be there in the future, because as you say, there is an unpredictability about it. And that's why I think you know, a, much, a much better way of looking at this issue is saying that you're developing an insurance policy. So sure, most of your genotypes are still going to be locally adapted, but when things start falling over, at least you've got some genotypes that are going to actually be able to survive. So what we're then saying is then saying, that's, that's why we have this, this leptokurtic distribution out there, right? So we're saying, you know, take some close by, take the majority, if you like, that are locally adapted, take some further out and some are really long way out. So the majority is still going to be locally adapted, but you're boosting that genetic diversity generally to allow that insurance policy to kick in. That's absolutely correct. And, you know, I don't think we should use the word assisted migration because, you know, gene flow is not the same as migration. And we really are talking about, in this particular case, not going outside the historical distribution of a particular species, right? So. Yeah, I guess, you know, if, if you've got a lot of, um, you know, ecological or environmental isolation, then when you look at the genetic uh, structure of a species across a geographical range, you might say that there's a limited limitation of gene flow between these different habitats. And I guess maybe it's hard to know, just looking at those patterns, whether it's because it's a bad disperser or whether it's being competitively excluded from those habitats. So I guess that would affect your prediction of whether you would uh, need to, you know, <laughs> so you just didn't like that yeah, system dispersal. But that yeah. idea of when the environment changes, it might change their dispersal ability between habitats beyond what you might infer based on the current genetic structure. I don't know how you do that. Yeah, but, but again, if, if you're only sourcing 10 or 20% from those distant populations, you know, you're probably fairly safe, I suspect, unless you get to the stage where there are some serious reproductive incompatibilities kicking in, right? Then you could get into trouble, and that's the situation that you want to avoid. But you know, we do have some rough guidelines, both in plants and in animals, when we think that incompatibility is going to kick in. So I think, I mean, you know, I, I take your point, but I think as long as you're ensuring that the majority are still local, 
then you're probably okay. You really are just building up this insurance policy that allows you to at least have a base for the future. I mean, there's nothing worse than going to a reveg site, and I'm sure many people in this room have done it, you know, and everything's dead, right? You know, people have put a lot of work into it, local communities put a lot of work into it, and everything has fallen over because you've had this drought period or this extreme temperature period, and you know damn well that there are genotypes out there that could actually survive in those situations. And, you know, and I think that is basically typified thinking in the reveg community for a long time, and as evolutionary biologists, we owe it to that community to move out of that phase of thinking.